Thank you, Sean. That's uh, that's a uh, very kind words. Um, <clears throat> and 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 uh, if you've been around AA any length of time, you'll know that they, these folks have given back to me way more than I could ever possibly bring. Um, but that's the way this loving God of mine works in my life today. Uh, my name is Ed, and, and I'm an alcoholic. I am uh, in awe of this this meeting. Um, I have to tell you. I didn't know coming in, and I'm glad I didn't, because this is these are the kind of gifts and rewards for being sober, showing up, and being present that uh, that that my God um, allows me to experience today. Um, I got sober on the 15th of October. How long am I speaking? Uh, 15 to 20. Okay. All right. Thank you. <laughs> All right. Let me get going. I've been known to get emotional, man, and and so I'm not saying that. As I'm not being apologetic because it's actually a part of my truth today. Um, it, the beauty is that the uh, the emotion and the tears are joy and not and not pain. Um, so on the 15th of October in 2013, um, to the best of my knowledge and recollection, is when uh, when I had my last drink, and um, I was 56 years old. Um, I had been introduced to AA in 1999 and then again in 2006 um, I came here and I did that pretty little dance on the perimeter of Alcoholics Anonymous without doing anything to change and uh, and what I got for my efforts was nil like the uh, it says in the how it works um, I got seven years of pain that I didn't know existed um, we get into that just a little bit uh, what it was like what I was like uh, um, what happened and what I'm like now. Um, it was 1969 when uh, um, my, I come from a family full of drinkers. And when I say family, there's a couple hundred of us extended, you know. Um, you can see my Irish skin all burn up. I haven't learned how to stay out of the sun yet. But uh, it, it seemed to be a, a thing for us. Um, uh, and it was unspoken, too, that there was a lot of death in, in, for generational deaths from, uh, from alcohol and alcoholism. Uh, but but it went unspoken. Um, and so at the age of 12, and I didn't know then, but like, if you, it seems to me, I'm of the opinion that the doctor wrote his opinion about me uh, because it's, it's, almost, it's almost autobiographical, autobiographical for me to read that thing. Um, how the hell they knew me, that book was written 18 years before I was born. Um, but I hear other people say that too. That's why I know I'm in the right place. So I'm 12 years old and I drink as much as I can, as fast as I can for as long as I can. And I black out. And for the next 44 years, that's basically my story. Um, taking me and places that I never thought I would be, um, doing things that I never thought I'd be doing and with people that I never thought I would be with. Um, In 1974, um, I got my first girlfriend pregnant. I had a boy, I was 16 and a half years old. I turned my back on him. I already knew that I was an alcoholic. I just didn't have any idea what that really meant. And so I'll go by the decades through this thing, all through the 70s, and you'll listen to, pay no attention to that I'm closer to 100 than I am you. Um, the, uh, the, the, the slow, progressive, painful disintegration of the human spirit is what I experienced. And, and that's where I connect with you guys, you know? Um, so all through the 70s, and, and I, I'm, I'm, I'm drinking like that all the time, anytime I get a chance. And so my boy's born, and, um, and six months later, I get hit by a car the year before my senior year in high school. And I'm in traction and they're, like, like they're written off, they give me the last rights and all that. And I come out of a coma a week later and find out that I'm gonna be in the hospital for three months. And, and all I can think of is like, I'll never forget the look on my mom's face. It's like her baby boy wasn't gonna die, you know, this, this, this relief that I can't describe. And, uh, and uh, a week later, I'm sneaking out, having people sneak alcohol into my hospital room because all I can think of is poor me um, I'm, I'm going to be here. I'm this, I'm that. And I get drunk and, and, and 
I mean, I was found out in about five minutes time. They're, you know, they're sucking blood out of me, checking all these different organs. And, and, and I'll never forget the look on my mother's face. It's like I cut her heart out of her chest with a butter knife or something, you know, uh, the pain that like she's thinking, how can you do this? What, what the hell is the matter with you? Um, and I couldn't see or feel any of that. All I could think about was me. So this self-centered part of me was a part of me always. And uh, it just got worse. And I didn't know it because this thing's so subtle and baffling and it's so powerful that I turned my back on everything and everybody that I love in this world. Um, so in 1979, I go away to Pittsburgh to school. I'm a funeral director by trade. Um, I've seen a lot of death because of this thing. And, uh, and I'm telling you, I would, I would go and I would, and I would run these funerals for people and I would see the heartache and I would be the first one back at the party afterwards and the last one to leave. Um, never seeing anything wrong with that behavior. Never no, noticing that, uh, that I had a different relationship with alcohol because to me, I'm looking at other people and I'm not following their life around. Like after they leave, they look like they're drinking like me, you know? But it turns out they weren't, they weren't thinking about the next five and they weren't thinking about drinking when they went home. You know, they weren't, they, they weren't thinking like that. I thought everybody thought like that. Um, the obsession and the compulsion are with me. That is who I am, okay, um, when I put alcohol in me. That does not define me anymore. Uh, but I do know without a shadow of a doubt that if I pick up a drink today, my only experience is that I leave you for seven years because I've done it twice. And it's both times seven years. And I don't believe I have seven left in me. I'm too old. And, uh, and the truth is, I have found this solution to be so much better than any drunk I ever had my whole life, not even close. Um, and so we moved into the 80s. I marry my girl. I'm, I'm, in, I'm in love with this girl, and she's in love with me. And we get married, and she's the only one that acts like it. Uh, because here's the thing. I did. I love that little girl more than my next breath of air, except when it came time to choose to drink or to go home or to drink or to be with her, to drink, to do the right thing. I always chose to drink. Always. Um, the few times that I didn't meant that I could drink if I went with her. Um, so um, we moved through and, 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 and we're in love. And I'm telling you, I would have given that girl anything except for my presence. And, um, and so we would fight and it was always about my alcohol. It was always about my drinking. Um, the rest of the time we cared for each other and it was loving and nurturing except that now uh, I'm, I'm spiraling downward now and drinking more and more. Um, so in the early 1990s, my dad retires and I move into a position of, of, of ownership and, and, and of running my family business. And what that meant to me was I just delegate all my responsibility in life to other people and I'd be free to go do what I want to do. A little hitch in that thing, I went to give blood for my dad for a small operation, found out I have hepatitis C. Oh, I said, well, what's that mean? I went to my doctor and he said, well, it's chronic and, uh, and it's not gonna kill you. I, can I drink, I says. And he says, well, yeah, cause he's thinking like a normal human being. He's thinking that's one or two. And, uh, and my truth is that I've never been able to stop at one or two. Uh, because that's when I get the sensation of, oh, yeah, there it is, and I always fly by. Um, and so for the next 20 years, I drank on a diseased liver. Um, but in 1999, my family couldn't, they couldn't stand watching me die anymore, and they intervened, and they sent me to my first rehab. And, um, and I went there kicking and screaming. I was 42 years old, and I looked like the biggest baby that you've ever seen in your life because I really didn't want any part of this. I went for, I didn't like seeing my mother cry and I didn't like all these other things. I went for all the wrong reasons. And so when I came out of there, um, the people at the bar where I was still going back to couldn't believe I wasn't drinking and I'm making a big deal out of it. And one day I picked up a, a beer to celebrate some guy's birthday who I didn't know. So it didn't take much of an excuse for the, uh, 
for the obsession and the compulsion kicked in and I was off and running for seven years. And um, I buried my mother and she was writing me letters, these beautiful letters about, about how I needed to get my faith back. And, and, and I'm thinking, uh, I know what you're talking about. You're talking about church. I know. And I'm thinking all these things. And it turns out she was right. <laughs> Even if it was for her reasons, she was right. Um, and so in 2006, I go to my next rehab. Um, I still have no contact with my son yet. And, um, and he's the furthest thing from my mind, to tell you the truth, because um, at this point in my life, I got a drink. And uh, um, I spent lots and lots of years trying to control it, trying to, just like you read in the book, I would take a month off. And I always chose February because it's 28 days. And, uh, and I made it once. And the rest of the time, my wife got tortured to death because I was miserable. See, the, the uh, spiritual uh, malady that I suffer from kicks in when I can't drink or when I try not to drink. That's when I become maladjusted to life. I don't know how to do it without alcohol. And I'm not happy if I don't have alcohol to lubricate me through my day. So I go away and I'm pretty sick now, I'm 49 years old. And uh, I come out of this place and I'm going to four meetings a day. I was coming home to bury my niece who overdosed the, day, the three days before. And I, I begged that, that rehab to keep me one more day so I didn't have to do this. And they said, no, it's time for you to, you know, to go and grow up and, be, and join life. And uh, I had a major resentment against those people, although I didn't know it until I went through the steps of this program. Uh, to find out just how angry at the entire world I was, thinking I wasn't mad at anybody. Um, and so my family is very concerned about me, but I'm going to meetings and I'm going to meetings and I'm doing everything in my power not to take the steps, the 12 steps of a 12 step program, uh, which is completely insane. Uh, unwillingness, unwilling to change. Um, that's for you. If I go to meetings, I'm starting to feel better. I think I'll be fine. Well, 11 months of that, and um, inside I was, I was torturing myself. Um, so in the meantime, I'm burying a couple more family members who are trying desperately to save me, to help me, and they just can't do it because I'm not willing. I don't, I'm not, I'm not uh, willing to take their help. And uh, in 2012, uh, um, my, uh, my brother, my oldest brother, Joe, my, Joe, uh, my brother Joe is my hero. Um, he's a Vietnam vet, and he was a Division I uh, football player, and, uh, and he was just, he was everything to me. Um, but he had it, and, and, and he drank himself straight to dead, yeah, just, just bypassing our strongest natural instinct to survive, and that's exactly where I was heading to. So I took my dad down to see his oldest son before he died in Florida. And I'm running in and out of my brother's apartment to the trunk of a rental car, guzzling Bacardi. And my dad's sitting on the porch waiting for his oldest boy to die, watching his youngest son kill himself. And it never occurred to me that maybe, just maybe, that might be hurting my father's feelings a little bit. Because I am completely enwrapped in self-centeredness and self-delusion that I have no, no concept of how I'm affecting anybody in the world, especially the people that love me the most. I took that love and I used it as a weapon against people. I turned it on them and uh, to get what I wanted and what I needed out of life. And uh, um, so my brother took his last breath and we buried him. And six months later, my wife died from ovarian cancer. People are lined up. People are lined up to come say goodbye to my wife and she's begging them to help me on her deathbed. And, uh, and they're saying, Jen, he doesn't want our help. And so I buried my girl and eight months later, it took eight months and it didn't look like it then, that night at three o'clock in the morning on Route 1 in Pennsylvania, didn't look like any gift from God, but those state police pulled up behind me and pulled me off the side of the road and I got my first DUI and for some reason that's what kicked in for me 
And I thought to myself, I need to get back to Alcoholics Anonymous and I need to take the 12 steps and take this thing serious. Um, which is all anybody ever wanted, especially my bride, you know? Um, and so I come back this time and I come back with a different attitude. Um, I think it's not going to work. I don't believe anything you say, but, and I'm screaming at people that, you know, my wife's dead. How am I going to make it, make that, make this up to her? You people don't have anything for that. And I'm screaming at you and you're going like this. You keep coming back, man. Just keep coming back. And so I said that, that very same thing to these two ladies that I barely knew. And, and they said to me, what step are you working on? And I said, four. And they said, well, why are you trying to work on nine? You're not ready. And these two beautiful w women brought me back to where I was supposed to be in the program, brought me back to where I was, and I went through the steps in order. And I went through them with my sponsor. And the most amazing thing happened is that seven months sober, I started taking the steps because I finally stopped crying. Seven months sober, I find out they have a cure for, uh, for hepatitis C, but you have to be six months without alcohol. <laughs> I qualify. They do a biopsy on my liver and my doctor says, oh, we got to get you on this now. I'm just at the breaking stage of moving into cirrhosis. I get cured from that disease, which is miraculous. And uh, I take the steps of AA and I go through them in order and I find freedom in the fifth step. I finally find out the truth about myself in that fourth step and it was not, it was just like my, my sponsor said, put there to help you, not to torture you. It's your story, write it the hell down and move on. And I did. And I'm not believing you. It's not going to work. But I did that fifth step with my loving God of mine and my sponsor. And, my, and it started out with my forehead on my own kitchen counter, weeping at what I had become. And when I was done several hours later, I was looking at another human being in the eye for the first time, weeping, but had a smile coming out of my heart. And it was showed itself on my face all at the same time. Freedom freedom. And I thought that was all the freedom in the world. And I come to find out it was just the tip of the iceberg. So now I know all about myself in step six and seven. And I do believe why they're so short is because what am I supposed to say? No, I, don't, I like that self-centered prick. I think I'll, I'll keep being him, you know? Oh, but I'll, oh, maybe this procrastination thing will work for me later on. I already know that they've, met, they've never worked for me. They've never served me and they never will. And it was time for me to change and address these things. And the beauty of, what, of it was, now I have an opportunity to fix these things by giving them over to my loving creator. Am I willing? Yes. Am I always willing? Eh, I'd be lying to you <laughs> if I said that. You know, because I wanna sit in that pain a little, every now and then. And so, so I go through the steps, and, and, and about a year and a half into my sobriety, I, I run into these young people, right? And they're, and they're like losing their mind. They're, they're losing their mind. And I'm, I'm getting happy now too. And it's coming out of my heart. And they look at me and they say, you are coming with us. <laughs> and I said, okay. And that's what I was taught to say in AA. Okay, you, wanna, you, you need to speak, okay. You need to, okay. And like scared to death of everything. So I get hooked up with these young guys. And I mean, so, so, so the thing is, like they, they said, look at this guy, you know, and obviously you just need to be young at heart and you come with us. And that's what I did and, and, and started on a journey of service. Um, I was getting into service in my home group, scared of the coffee pot, but I took the commitment anyway. <laughs> they taught me how to make coffee. It was not the death of me. And I moved as in a group rep and I moved up the chairs and through a uh, zone coordinator in Chester County. Um, and I serve today as the alternate the, um, uh, G GSR for my own group. I don't say any of that because it was my idea or, or how wonderful I am. I, just because it, this, this place where all that pain lived, that, that, that pitiful de demoralization we talk about, and that place way so deep down in my soul has been replaced with a joy that I can't describe to you because of this program and this loving God of mine. And when I hear you, 
I don't care what you call your power. It doesn't matter. At first, I had a guy that I couldn't see anywhere because I was completely in darkness and self-centeredness. So when I removed those layers and put some light on that darkness and God revealed himself from within me, he was already here. He never left. I turned away from him or it. I don't like the gender thing either. Um, it, it's for all of us, this loving power. So what name you put on your power, I don't care because that's not the important part. The important part is I want to hear your experience with your power, how it brought you up out of the darkness and into a life of love and service. And that's what I want to know. That's my daily reprieve. I need to maintain that spiritual condition. And I don't have any other place to go to get it. Right here. Right here. And we are all inclusive. I love, I love our interpreters that are here tonight. I, I can say that with, with, with the honesty in my heart. That I love all of them. And you too. Um, that young man that I turned my back on 10 years ago came to work with me. He has, I have five grandchildren that they have been uh, kind enough to let me be in their life after I chose to turn my back on my boy and him and my daughter-in-law let me watch these kids grow up and they are crazy about their papa, <laughs> just crazy. Um, the, uh, the beauty of service and things that, we went to the first young people's conference in Ireland a few years ago. And I'm standing in a circle of about 300 people and they're saying the serenity prayer in their native tongue. And a guy from, from Latvia is in my left hand and a guy from Serbia is in my right hand and they're saying the serenity prayer. And I have goosebumps all over my body from the spiritual experience that I'm going through that I'm allowed to live through because I'm present today. And I choose not to pick up a drink there's no drink that ever came close to this joy that I'm living. Um, I, my, my brother Tommy died uh, about a year and a half ago, and uh, uh, he was not an alcoholic, but I got to be a brother to him before he died. And I got to take him to his cancer treatments, and I got to be there for, the, for when he went on his ventilator, and we thought he's never coming off. And I come in one day, and he's laying there, no ventilator, and he said to me, for some reason, it was just he and I, and he said, I thought I missed my chance. And I said, what's that, Tom? And he said, to tell you that I love you. Now, we don't talk like that in my house. <laughs> there was never a doubt about it. We loved each other, but we don't talk like that. And, he, and, and I said, I love you too. And we started talking about him coming home. The next day I came back in, he was back on the ventilator and never came off. Those, those are the last words that I spoke with my brother. He spoke to me, and I'll never, ever, ever leave me. They'll never leave my heart. So in the midst of all that pain and grief, God sends this beautiful moment and gift to me. For what? What did I do? I showed up. I was a brother to my brother in time of need. That's it. Same thing with my dad. I got to tell my dad what a wonderful father he was. And he died in my home while I was caring for him. And people from AA showed up in my house and they were there caring for my daddy, changing diapers and things like that. Why? Because that's what we do. <laughs> Un unconditional love, unsolicited acts of love. People show up at my house and start taking care of my dad because they know that I'm struggling. Um, this thing is so much for outside of my scope of, of, uh, of, of belief. Um, if I wasn't experiencing it, I, 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 I don't know. I could never make it up. I got a chance to go to 2015. Hey, hey Adam, I'm sorry to interrupt. I just want to remind you it's been about 20 minutes. So if you could wrap oh, okay. it up. Okay, I'm, I'm finishing right now. Thank you. Thank you very much for your service. Go to the international and, and 20, 80,000 of us, and then um, um, and become a missionary in, South, in, in Southwest Kenya uh, because they need an undertaker there to teach them how to do what I do. 
7,000 miles away. Um, I didn't write that script, guys. Uh, so uh, thank you. I appreciate that. And um, uh, yeah, if you're new, man, just stick around. This thing is, is so incredible. It's amazing. Thank you, everybody.